Hi, teardown time again, and what we've got today is this. This is a compact. It stands for Computer Telemetry Transponder. A subscriber called James emailed me to say, hey, we're scrapping these at work, would you want to um, tear one down? Well, firstly, I thought, well, you know, what the hell is it? Which is always a good start. Um, it's used for undersea operations. It's effectively uh, like a secondary radar, radar for undersea operations. If you're operating something like a, an ROV for um, oil exploration or whatever, you need to know where you are. So what they do is they plant a few of these at known locations in the seabed, or they ha um, hang them on, um, they put a float on and hang them on a chain or a rope from a weight, weight on the bottom. And it's an, uh, an acoustic transponder, so your ROV sends out a ping it's picked up by this and this then responds after a, a fixed known time with a, a, an ID as well so it knows which one it is. So it can calculate its distance from each of these, each of these units. And as well as actual distance they can also do monitoring. Um, they'll me measure things like uh, depth through the pressure, temperature, salinity. There's also some versions which have got an inclinometer. So for example if you've got some sort of structure on the seabed like a wellhead you, you stick one of these in it and it will actually um, send you back information. For example, if it starts tilting, it will give you an angle indication uh, remotely. So it's just like a, a remote, um, remote sensor, of course, being underwater. The only way to get communications to things is uh, through ultrasonic signals. Let's take a look, a close look at this thing. Um, this thing is extremely heavily made. I mean, the steel, steel flanges are about 10 millimetres thick. Um, obviously being working undersea this one's designed for 1350 meters depth which corresponds to about 2000 psi pressure so it has to withstand the enormous pressure of being sat, sat undersea and still work. At the top this is the actual uh, ultrasonic transducer so this receives the interrogation signal from the device trying to find out where it is and then sends back sends back the signal. This has got a fairly slight, slightly soft rubbery feel to it. Here there's a hole here, I'm guessing that's a port for a pressure and or a temperature sensor. Also there's a few of these attached. Now what these are, these are lumps of uh, probably zinc or magnesium. Uh, these are called sacrificial anodes. Um, this is basically to prevent corrosion of the main metal structure. It's quite a common technique used for ships and basically anything that's made of metal that uh, has to work underwater. The idea being that um, the corrosion process is an, is an electrochemical process and the sacrificial anodes are made of a metal which has a more negative electrochemical potential so that the corrosion corrodes, the, um, corrodes these in preference to the metal um, and obviously they, they gradually get eaten away over time. You can see these have got, got fairly uh, well worn out. Obviously if these do completely go then it will start corroding the metal. We can see although this, this thing's been underwater, yeah the metal is actually there's no sign at all of any corrosion on it because of these things. Um, these, these need to be electrically connected to um, the metal part. So it forms, it effectively works the same principle as a, as a battery. Right, this is the other end. Uh, the main thing you hear, see here, this is a um, basically a release mechanism. The idea being that when you want to get these things back, instead of having to send a sub or an IV or whatever to go and get them, they, uh, can, you can put a flotation collar on them and attach them using this spring hook to a sort of lumber concrete or something with a chain or a rope and they can then send a signal that causes the hook to unhook and it will just float back to the surface by itself so it just saves a lot of cost to recover them. There's a connection here which is an RS-232 port for configuration. This has got quite badly corroded. So obviously this rubber cover isn't particularly effective. Uh, there's more of these sacrificial anodes. The interesting thing to note is there's actually one on each different piece of metal. There's actually a separate anode because they rely on the electrical connection to the metal they're protecting. So there's this one here on the outer frame, there's this one for the release mechanism, and there's this for the actual main, main body of them. So they're not relying on the electrical connection of the structural fixings to um, maintain that protection. There's another port here which again that could be a, uh, a pressure or temperature sensor or something, we'll have a look inside. Unfortunately some of these bolts from the cage have got bent at some point so we're going to have to apply a bit of uh, extreme disassembly techniques to actually cut these off and uh, to be able to get, get it apart. You see the construction is these are 
a plastic and a metal um, clamping ring that actually clamps the thing to make a seal. Interesting to note on the metal things, these insulators, again this is about the corrosion protection. If you've got two dissimilar metals connect, um, connected to each other electrically, um, that can be a, a source of corrosion because it forms a battery in conjunction with the uh, salt, salt water. So there's these insulators that actually insulate the, um, the metal cage from the, the metal of this ring. Interesting that did actually pop out a little bit. There's a warning in the manual that obviously because these things have been un under sea they could actually be still at a little bit of pressure. So the way that popped out there clearly was just a little bit of um, air pressure inside that to uh, make it come out like that. Right, so this is the end with the uh, release hook on it. Um, we'll see a few things here. This is clearly the pressure sensor to measure the depth, the um, effectively the depth. This will be a temperature sensor. You can see there's two two different wire colours. Um, so this is going to be a, almost certainly a four wire PT100 uh, platinum temperature sensor. Uh, platinum sensors give um, probably about the highest accuracy of a, any sort of temperature sensor and that looks like it's just measuring the temperature of this end plate um, obviously that's solid metal so that's going to give you the, the temperature of the water one thing for, for accurate um, distance measurement the speed of sound in water is dependent on temperature pressure and salinity so uh, these provide information to help provide give a more accurate um, figure I'm guessing they actually send it back and then it's the receiver that figures out any compensation factors based on temperature. This looks like a sort of pressure bulkhead type arrangement to go to the uh, the serial port connector so this is just to provide a watertight high pressure seal for the electrical connection through to this um, this connector and here we've got a, a motor and gearbox which is to, to operate the um, the release mechanism and there's a little board on here, there's a few odd, odd bits and pieces here um, so I'm guessing that's going to be the front end for the platinum resistance sensor and again there'll be the, the air signal conditioning for the pressure sensor. These pressure sensors, the ones like this are typically a strain gauge. There's like a sort of membrane that's exposed to the pressure and then there's um, resistive elements on a, a diaphragm that as it flexes the resistance changes and it provides a small differential output voltage proportional to pressure. Um, the only other thing here, there's a little micro switch which is a, a limit switch for the um, to release, so uh, it will fire up that motor. Let's see what happens with that. Um, there's also a device here. Not quite sure what this is. Oh, yeah, I think this is a tilt switch. I'm guessing it's probably got mercury or something in it. Um, so this probably just tells you which way up it is. It could be that it turns it off when it's not in the right direction or it just gives an alarm signal if it's not not vertical. Um, yeah, I think I can feel some I, think I can feel mercury slopping around in there, so that, that'll be just a mercury uh, tilt switch. So some of these do actually have a proper in, um, inclinometer for measuring exact exact angles, but that's that's not fitted on the, this version. I can't see any obvious connectors, so they probably use a different board. Or maybe they, maybe it's at the other end. Uh, there are a few unpopulated spaces here actually. Maybe that's for the inclinometer interface. One nice thing about this, of course, these things are built very much up to a spec and not down to a price. And I don't know how much these cost, but I doubt you get much change out of 10 grand for one of these. But also, apart from the actual purchase cost, if one of these goes down, um, it's very expensive to go down and replace it. You know, you've got the hire of all the ROV or whatever you used to do it, so you're probably talking sort of tens of thousands of pounds or dollars to go out and replace one of these. So these have to be made um, as, as reliable as they as they can be. For example, I'm using Max on there, one of the most sort of the nicest motors you can buy. <clears throat> very expensive, but uh, yeah, very nice, very reliable. See, there's a little gear gear train on there. 
be interesting to take this apart actually and see how they've waterproofed that um, that rotary connection. I guess there's probably quite a few O-rings. Obviously, you've got these two big O-rings, which are the, the main seal for the uh, the main enclosure. So here's this release mechanism. What you've got, you've got this circular motorized section here. So this. This hook goes and sits in there. It's latched by the um, yes, yeah, so that's now latched. And then to release it, I'm just gonna keep leave the motor running. You see this hook. The hook goes in there to hang onto the line. And then to release it, it just turns the motor on and ping, and it floats up to the surface. One thing that's a little bit surprising is they haven't conformal coated this PCB. You know, obviously, this is reliant on the um, the ceiling for seawater protection, but I would have thought, yeah, this is usually an environment where you may get the odd little drop of water when they're replacing battery packs or whatever. So I'm a little bit surprised they haven't put any protection um, on these PCBs against sort of just small amounts of moisture. Right, here's the transducer end. Um, first thing you notice this high voltage sticker. You know, the, the, these are piezo transducers and obviously this thing's got to produce a very high output level because the, these things got a range of about, about a mile or two kilometers or so. Um, so they drive the piezo with a very high voltage pulse, about two or three kV. So that's what that's the reason for the uh, high voltage uh, label there. So and you can see fairly clearly what's going on here. We've got two connections. Yeah, I suspect there's probably um, maybe two separate transducers, one for receive and one transmit. Uh, I guess, although maybe not. There's a, there's a relay there. Maybe there's some switch over. It could be this is for something else. So we've got this is obviously clearly the transformer that produces the high voltage going out to the transducer. You've got two transistors driving it there. Um, so I'm guessing this is possibly the receive path and that there's an inductor there's probably a, uh, a filter and some um, signal conditioning stuff. Down here we've got the battery. This is, um, there's a few different battery options on this. There's NICAD, alkaline and lithium. The alkaline version, uh, it will run for about 900 days in listening mode and the lithium it's about twice that 1700 days so sort of three to five years because again obviously you don't have to go go down and keep replacing the batteries on these things um, one interesting little snippet of information um, I got was that even with obviously a large lithium battery pack like this is quite hazardous and there's usually sort of fairly significant um, tra restrictions on transportation and air freight um, for shipping large battery packs obviously because of the amount of stored energy in them but because these things are in this massive great metal tube that's sort of to withstand 2000 psi there's actually no restrictions on shipping these things with the batteries because the enclosure is so solid that whatever happens to the battery there's no way it could actually you know explode or actually get outside the casing and obviously that's quite fortunate because these things are going to be shipped you know would need to be air freighted to wherever the the um, marine operation is so it's just quite interesting that someone's actually applied a bit of common sense in the regulations in that okay yes it's a dangerous lithium battery but it's so well encased that there's just no way it's going to do anything um, dangerous externally except maybe get slightly warm and on the other side there's this board now what I'm guessing is that these are actually filters to select specific frequencies these inductors lots of trimmers some sort of precision capacitors here and some uh, what's that TLC 3702 comparators so I think the this is a fairly old, old model it's like 1990s so that the different messages and signals are just done by using different ultrasonic frequencies as far as I understand it or maybe it's modulations on the on a fixed frequency carrier or something but the, these look very much like sort of analog LC filters probably very narrow notch filters these is a test date 2001 so I think the, these are sort of only fairly recently gone out of service but there's, there, there are about two or three models ahead of this now for the current production. Obviously, they're, they're almost certainly going to be using digital modulation and DSPs and so on. Uh, these are ATF 7500s. So these are like PLD devices. So I'm guessing maybe these are just like perhaps a tone detector that gives a pulse when it detects a specific frequency. And then these are probably maybe multiplexers and shift registers just to provide, send that back to the, um, the processor. So there's a few more of them on the, uh, the board underneath as well.
And the second board under here, there's a processor here. 63B03 Hitachi, sort of fairly old uh, microprocessor. Looks like an Altera program logic device. EP610, yeah, it's a fairly um, simple programmable logic. There's a Philips P, uh, PCF8573 real time clock and real time clock crystal down there. Um, there's a custom hybrid, this is actually stamped with the manufacturer Sensodyne, um, so this is probably going to be some sort of signal conditioning hybrid or something that's um, <coughs> custom made for this application. It's actually been stuck down with silicone. Some fairly uh, lumpy bits in there, no idea what that does. And there's a few more of these um, inductors. Looks like a fairly similar sort of circuitry that we had on that board, but there's just, just one of them, so maybe that's an expansion board for different functionality to provide more, more frequencies that it understands. And there's a ROM that's just a plastic case, one time programmable ROM. It's quite as though it's left a, left a little hole so you can get at it from the uh, when this board's on. There's a few bits of silicone, it's not like things like on the crystal and all the socketed parts just to stop them falling out. And just lots of uh, good old analog through hole uh, stuff and fairly uh, densely packed but quite nicely laid out board. Lots and lots of test points all over here. And there's uh, just a connector that goes through the um, through the chassis onto this other board up here. All right, it's the battery pack. I think this is just a massive great bunch of D-cells. There's a little board in the top of this though. That's, uh... All right, it looks like it's just a couple of fuses and a couple of diodes. There's a couple of packs within here. Um, 31 half volts, 16 amp hours. August 05. Looks like these are held together with some um, metal rods through the middle to make it into a nice rigid, uh, rigid battery pack. So I'm going to stake these are in. Yeah, about 23 volts, so they're obviously fairly low compared to their 30 odd volt uh, normal spec. They're Fujitsu alkaline D cells. Obviously, these are going to be welded um, with tabs the same way as you see. Um, rechargeable battery packs built and you can see these are actually soldered across here onto these welded tabs I think they're going to be uh, pretty welded yeah, so these are basically uh, standard D-cells they just uh, spot welded these tabs on to join them up a couple of interesting little details here. One is that this whole assembly is actually designed to be floating because obviously when this thing when this thing's assembled um, you don't want this to be putting any stress on the uh, the circuitry so the idea is that this, this can move around so this will sit wherever it sits in, in the housing without putting any stress onto the um, PCB assembly. Also there's a big capacity obviously that's to provide a power reserve so that when it's transmitting its high power signal outwards it, that provides enough energy reserve so it doesn't dip and brown out the battery supply or anything. Right, at the top end here there's another board here. Um, I actually got a, uh, a maintenance manual for a slightly different version of this. This is described as a tuning board. So um, this is probably just coupling to the transducer. There's only, um, there's only two connections onto the transducer. So it's obviously a single piezo unit. Um, there's, a, there's a relay on here. It's a high voltage, high voltage capacitor. And just a few other odd passives, nothing major here, but maybe actually there's, there's two relays. I wonder actually maybe um, these relays perhaps switch different capacitor values in to alter the resonant frequency so it, um, it can use different frequencies for transmit and receive, something like that. Um, I'm guessing, obviously, there's a, delay, a turnaround delay between when it receives and when it transmits, which is well defined. I'm guessing they've defined that to be long enough to allow relays to switch over. So, you know, if it, I know, perhaps it's, let's say it's say 50 milliseconds, it sends, it sends a signal, reconfigures itself for transmission, then sends the transmission. So as long as the receiver knows what that internal delay is, it doesn't really matter what it is, because um, it's measuring the difference between that nominal delay and what, when it actually receives it to figure out the distance. But obviously, if you're transmitting a few kV into a transducer, and then got a nice high gain, um, high gain receive stage, you really don't want to be sticking that high voltage up your receiver. So it's easier just to flip it over the relay than um, have lots of protection circuitry. Right, this port at this end just looks like it's an option for something. It's not fitted in this. There's just this um, O-ring seal plug and a, 
Allen screw from the inside, so there's probably the option for an additional sensor that goes in there that's not um, not fitted on this one. Um, this is the feed through for the serial connection. You see, there's no ring there, and the centre bit just looks like it's just probably filled with positive compound or something. There's some uh, feed throughs there. In fact, which, which you can see that there's actually a little bit of water in the bottom of there. Um, these serial ports are mainly going to be used just before these things are deployed, so obviously that, that's all corroded. They, they may sort of be almost regarded as semi-expendable um, semi parts, because once it's deployed the serial port isn't going to be, be used until it's hauled up again. It probably gets maintained and the battery replaced then anyway. And this is the temperature sensor. It's got this quite long thread on it, presumably to get the sensor fairly near the surface. Um, so there's four wires on here. There's going to be a PT100, in fact, the yeah, that's going to be its resist, calibrated resistance at zero degrees C. And um, they use a four wire measurement so that to negate any effect of the the leads. And it's sort of a very accurate uh, temperature measuring measuring element. You can easily get your result, you know, measure down to like. 0.1.01 degrees C accuracy with these things once they're calibrated. Now on this uh, input board that's where the PT100 sensor goes and you can see that they've got these precision resistors at 0.1% um, low temperature coefficient resistors for the measurement front end there's a precision op amp there um, that's a 12-bit A to D converter there's an E squared prom there which I'm guessing maybe holds some calibration data. Interesting that resistor there looks like it's been soldered on. My guess is they select that on test, yeah, they actually test and calibrate by um, putting a specific resistor value in there. And there's a few sort of trimmers on there as well. But all the resistors around this section are um, sort of 0.1% high precision resistors. What's a little bit surprising, they've got this AD581, this is a high precision voltage reference. Now I'm not quite sure why they'd need a voltage reference on here because the, the PC100 you can measure that by just measuring it against the resistance. Similarly, the pressure sensor, I'd imagine that's a sort of resistive device, unless maybe the inclinometer has some sort of um, pretty, yeah, absolute voltage requirement on it. But the only thing you'd probably want to measure on um, measuring absolute voltage with is the uh, the battery condition. So that's perhaps a slight overkill on the uh, quality of the voltage reference on this thing. But then again, cost isn't a major object for something like this. It's all about reliability. So. Uh, Maybe they just stuck a high precision thing there, so they just didn't need to worry about the accuracy of it. Obviously these things are going to work over a fairly wide temperature range. You know, the bottom of the ocean is going to be pretty cold a lot of the time, so that is quite an important aspect of this, is that it can actually work over a wide, you know, a, a sort of low, low temperatures reliably. And this is the pressure sensor. Um, this is made by uh, Druck, who are a German company that specialises in pressure measurement stuff. So. That's a sort of fairly standard component. I think it's probably it says um, 60 bar at 10 volts, but the, um, the depth. This is I'm guessing that's not not its limit. This is probably just one calibration point because this thing's at 1300 meters. The pressure is probably about twice that I think. All right, so a little play with this. Um, I was told that one of the ways these for testing is to uh, wind a coil around the transducer to give it a signal. So I've done that. I've connected that to a burst signal generator and um, had a quick play with frequencies. And it seems that when you give it a 72 kilohertz burst, that causes it to transmit back. And we've actually got a delay. The delay that's the transmit burst, and that's the uh, sorry, that's the burst that I'm sending, and that's what it's giving giving it back. And there's a delay of exactly 125 milliseconds there. Now when I was playing I did hear the relays click over once but they haven't done it since. I'm not quite sure maybe they're latching relays and they're put into a different mode or something. But um, there is some information in the manual about these uh, serial ports. I'll have a quick play with that see if I can configure it. You can configure different output power levels and so on. And you can actually hear this transducer clicking. Um, obviously this is designed to work in water and not air. I mean the, the, the output level in water is something ridiculous like 190 dB but obviously that's got a very tight coupling whereas in air you know you, you've got this barely audible click I've no idea what power level that's transmitting at compared to what it's potentially uh, capable of doing. I've hooked the serial port up um, don't get anything particularly interesting it looks like it's just showing the current configuration it gives you a menu to do uh, a few simple simple functions battery count I assume it's just a battery life counter um, there are a load of other commands listed in the manual, but I think that may be for a later version. Doesn't seem to be much 
in the way of interesting stuff going on here. So I'll try putting this in water, see if it sounds a little bit more audible. And I can actually feel the vibration on this glass surface, so it's putting a fairly powerful kick into the water. And as I say, this is um, it's got a range of I think something like a mile or so in water, and of course, water is a very good conductor of sound. Um, there are some other, basically it can, this is working its simple sort of ping back mode for navigation. There are some additional modes which you activate via um, a sequence of different burst frequencies to get it to do sort of send back information, but without knowing what, there's no information in the documentation I've got what those are, so I don't think there's any realistic chance of figuring those out. And I'm just looking at how it reacts, obviously this thing mostly sits in, um, since it sits in sleep mode, and there's, yeah, hardware. It mostly sits in sleep mode, and there's yeah, there's selective filtering on the on the amplifier. That's the only thing that's running when it's sitting waiting for it. And just by giving it bursts of different frequencies, there were some frequencies like 53 kilohertz where I saw the current consumption increase. Obviously, it was waking up, but obviously it would have been listening, looking for um, some specific commands, which, or without knowing, I can't really get it to do anything more useful. So I don't think there's really much more I can. Uh, get this to do. It's always worth taking a quick look through the ROMs on this sort of thing. So it looks like there's an engineering menu in there. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to get into that. But also you occasionally find little messages from people. Go to the end of the ROM. A little message from the uh, programmer, presumably a uh, guy called Nick Street. Well, after just trying a few random characters, now we know there is an engineering menu. I just try it, tried some single character, nothing out there. I thought, oh, control characters, uh, control D, got some what looks like some debug information, and control E, engineering menu. Obviously, don't really know what most of this is. It just does something, don't know what. Again, that does something else. Depth offset are probably to do with uh, the sensor. Let's try self test. Oh, so we've got some clickiness. So the relay's clicked and we've got some uh, clicks from the um, transducer there. Um, DAS test, I don't know what a DAS is, so I'm not quite sure unless that... Oh, that, that's maybe all the analog values. Um, so, for example, the temperature sensor is showing 2.7. If I just warm that up in my hand and try that again. Six. Yes, that's now gone up to 29.45, holding it. Um, I'd imagine the other information is probably pressure and the other various sensors. And release test. That ends the release. Just run that around once until it hits the switch. And this quick setup, what I suspect this is, this is a way of just combining all the um, setup data in a single string. So if you're setting up lots of these, it could be that all the configuration data is only just a couple of, maybe three bytes. So you can just type in, once you've got the configuration data for one, you can just type in that number and it'll set, all, set everything up. So it's always useful to look through the ROMs because you do quite often find these sort of little engineering things that can occasionally be quite useful to, to play around with. Well, here's the detail of how they've sealed this release mechanism. This is what I'm assuming is probably Teflon um, as an outer. This sort of sit, sits in here and there's two O-rings on here so this rotates on there. And this also sits on this um, thrust bearing so this is designed obviously all the forces trying to push into here so this bearing here is designed to take a very high force in this direction. There's a, all this is sort of pushing down on here. Then inside there's um, just another standard standard ball race to keep everything nice and straight. So it's a sort of very high quality bearings. There's also another one, the motor shaft. The end of the motor shaft gets supported on this bearing here. Then there's the big gear to couple it. So all sort of very, uh, very nicely engineered. And uh, able with, to withstand huge pressures. Although, I must admit, I would have thought 
you could maybe do do something clever with the magnetic coupling to actually avoid having to have any anything passing through but obviously you need to carry a, a fair amount of force to release that hook and you don't really want to risk it not releasing so uh, maybe this is the best option. Well, I'm just having a little poke around these filters with the scope. Um, what I've done is I've set up the uh, uh, signal generator, generator sweep from 30 up to 110 kilohertz because that's the frequency range the manual set it operated on. And um, if you actually look at the, uh, the filter, you can see some very clear peaks at specific frequencies on these different filters. So, so that's that's one of the filters, and then there's another one a little bit higher up, and another one higher there. Um, <clears throat> I think the reason they're using all this analog filtering stuff is for low power so that the thing is asleep you've got a very low power analog stage and it's only when the, these filters produce a high enough signal that they actually kick a comparator in and um, wake everything up and then it looks to qualify the, the actual frequency, yeah, pretty does a measurement to get, check that the frequency is spot on and check the timings and so on to validate it because you don't want this thing waking up and uh, wasting its battery on false, false alarms so it has to qualify the data fairly uh, carefully. Not quite sure what this hybrid's for. It may just be sort of analog, sort of high performance analog front end or something, and some filtering perhaps. Well, I've had a bit of a poke around this um, additional filter board, but I'm not seeing anything. I'm guessing maybe it has to be enabled to go into a special mode to um, discriminate all these different frequencies or something, but I'm not seeing any signal at all on there, so I uh, can't really tell what that's doing. Well, I've had a bit of a go at this sense with a knife, but I'm pretty sure this is this has just been moulded in this uh, rubber stuff, so it's not like a cover or anything that's going to come off easily. This cream stuff, this looks like sort of ceramic material that typically you find in piezo devices. And again, inside you can there's a base which also uh, sort of, I think sort of fairly hard ceramic or something. So I don't think there's really much chance of getting in there. I'm saying not going to bother shipping all this off. I don't think there's going to be anything really interesting in there, so I uh, have to uh, admit defeat, defeat on that one, I think. And you can see on these relays, the actual symbol on the top shows two coils, so these are latching relays. Um, these are quite commonly used on low-power equipment, so instead of having to energise the coil continuously, you just pulse one coil to turn it on and pulse the other one to turn it off. Just pulled the top off this uh, latching relay, so you can see uh, how it works. So one pulse on, one pulse off. So this one's got two coils. That you can also get ones that have got a single coil that you change the polarity to um, select whether you want to set or reset it. So another bit of uh, interesting, very obscure, very niche technology. Just the sort of thing I like. Built at pretty much cost cost no object for a very specialist job that I didn't even know existed. Um, thanks again to James for donating that. Um, if you work in some weird industry that uses strange bits of electronics no one's ever heard of that you're about to scrap, uh, send me an email. I'd be uh, quite interested to see it.